Hello and welcome to this portion of Active Living from the Orient Center. We're very fortunate today to have with us a good friend, uh, Jim Robeck. Jim has just returned from a fantastic trip uh, hiking Mount Kilimanjaro and we uh, welcome Jim to the session today and uh, we'd like to hear a little about, about your trip and uh, sounds to me like it was really exciting. That it was, it was the most <laughs> exciting trip, very exciting. Let's talk about uh, the mountain first of all. Okay. How high is this mountain? Okay, the mountain is 19,431 feet uh, high. Uh, approximately covers 18 feet across the, t 18 miles, I'm sorry, across the top of it. And it's mostly uh, all glaciers up there. There's no snow, it's just all glaciers. And I understand that uh, approximately uh, 12,000 years ago, there was all glaciers. And by 1927, it was only 82%. In 1962, it dropped to 55. And they figured by the year 2033, there'd be no more glaciers at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. So the glaciers are disappearing. They're disappearing, yes, they are. But what I'm getting at is this is a pretty high hike. In yes. other words, you're up there almost out of the atmosphere at 19,000 whatever, 400, 400 feet. feet. Uh, what, what in the world did you have to do to prepare to do this kind of a hike? Well, I started about uh, back last November, I came back from Cambodia and Vietnam, and basically what I did is I hiked about five miles every day with a 20-pound uh, backpack right here that I utilized and carried this so it could build up your cardio system. So basically did it here in Ball Mountain uh, over here off of Lapeer Road, and then also at Hadley Equestrian Trail over there in Ortonville and a few other places just to get different terrain to get some, uh, try to get as much elevation as I could because there was going to be a lot of elevation changes here in Kilimanjaro. So how many, how many um, uh, weeks did you work on this prior to the, the hike? The it was hike? Uh, basically six and a half months from the middle of last November till I went in June. So I hiked all the way up till the last day before I left to go on the airplane on a Wednesday. So right through the worst days Right through the worst days, snow, wind, ice, and whatever it was, I, I hiked it because I figured that this would experience you to the weather you made uh, to endure while you were there. Well, let's talk about the hike a little bit. Now, when you, when you got there, um, how far away from you, uh, from the mountain where, where you actually uh, located? Okay, from the ranger station where we basically started out at, that um, we went to the first spot there, and from that point on, it's about 47 miles to get to the base camp before you extend Kilimanjaro. So we had a hike for almost uh, seven days before we got there, so it was about 47 miles we had to hike. You had 47 miles of hiking before you even started to climb the mountain. That's correct. Wow, Yeah. amazing. <laughs> it was some brutal spots there, especially the wall was the most difficult one. It had to go over this wall, I think it was on the third day there, and that was pretty brutal, Ed, and that was pretty, well, straight up and then over it, and then continuous up and down over all the various lava rock and such that you had to endure. Now, you obviously didn't do this by yourself. You had, you, I, I assume you had some guides and that type of thing? Yes, there was. Uh, we had basically three guys that led us on the trails, but in the uh, support group, there was about another 30 some odd people that basically brought your camping stuff, your gear and such, and also they brought the food, the, the uh, tents, the, the tables, the chairs, all their cooking uh, utensils and heating, everything was brought in because there's no way to get in there. It's all by, by porters. And it's 47 miles hike just, to get, just, just to, to get to the mountain. To the base you, camp, yeah. Before you start the big hike up the, up the mountain. That's correct, yes wow. it is. Unbelievable. Yes, some fantastic uh, scenery and some fantastic places you had to walk and say, oh no, not another uh, good mountain to climb here. I, I say mountain, but it was pretty high up there. So. Well, how many people did you actually have on this, on this hike that were actually doing the hike? Uh, actual hikers, not the porters and that type of thing. Well, our group was 16 people. It was actually 14 who signed up for it and we had two leaders. Okay. And um, so with those uh, number of people, that's why we had like almost 35 porters and so who supported us. Wow. It was amazing. And what they basically did, every time we broke camp every day, they packed everything up and they carried it all the way up to the next base camp. And we'd leave at eight o'clock in the morning and they would basically pass us all about nine o'clock. And by the time we got to our campsite, they had the tent set up. Everything was set up ready for us to pick a tent, go put our stuff in there and relax before we had lunch or dinner, whatever the case may be, when we arrived at the camp. Sounds pretty plush to me. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> no, it was two you mean, man. It, you mean it wasn't like the Hilton? No, not really. <laughs> two man tents were on rocky grounds and uh, sometimes you were sleeping at night and you would slide down or go the other way. And it was kind of interesting that uh, there's no flat ground up there. And uh, fortunately what they do is they bring the pads also, which they bring uh, and put up the tents and then we bring our um, 
uh, air mattresses along, so we blow that up and use that plus our sleeping bag. But unfortunately, those air mattresses are kind of uh, slippery, so you're sliding down with your sleeping bag. And so uh, by the morning, you're down at the end of the other tent there, basically. And they're two-man tents, basically. Okay. Um, when you're going up this mountain, I assume that during the first 40 miles, you're still gaining altitude. Is that correct? Every day, yes. We're gaining altitude every day. Yeah. We're, they, what they basically goes up maybe two or three thousand, maybe sometimes uh, up to four thousand feet. Then we have to come back down. We try to acclimatize ourselves to the oxygen depletion. So uh, there was like th two days that we did that. So we went up and then we came down and then we went to the camp, basically. Okay. So until the final ascent, there was no acclimatization at that point because we were already pretty well spent. They said, no more. <laughs> a good couple of our guys said, shouldn't do that because you're going to waste a lot of your energy. Right. Well, how about food? I mean, they, I assume they've, the porters brought in food for yes, you guys. Yes, they did. They brought all the food in from day one. I mean, they're carrying it every day. I mean, the eggs, everything they had, the vegetables. The, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of meat. Uh, There's a little bit of fish we had, a uh, little bit of chicken, a lot of pasta, a lot of soup. Um, and uh, basically that was it. And we had good potatoes because they grew potatoes there, which was really good. That was really mm -hmm. helpful because I loved the potatoes. And uh, so, but there was enough to eat, but not, not much on the protein side of it because mm. the meat was not that plentiful. Okay. Now, how about, uh, I hate to mention this, but how about bathroom facilities? <laughs> Interesting. Tell us about that. Interesting you should ask that. So <laughs> people would ask that, especially the women, you know, say, okay, where's the bathroom? Say, well, the leader says, well, there's some rocks, women to the right. Man to the left, find a rock and go behind it and do what you got to do. And that's it, basically. <laughs> Until you got to the camps, they had a loo or bathroom or latrine at the uh, campsite. But they were portable also, so these porters had to carry these in, too. So they had to clean the bowls out and everything else every day, you know. So, um, so it, was, it was good. It was not a real problem. But uh, the women did it. They had no problem. So, they, so you hiked 40, was it 47, 47 miles? 47 miles to what you call the base camp? The base camp before you make the ascent okay. to the top of the mountain. And the base camp is at what elevation? At 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet. And it took you, what, six days to get there? Uh, about uh, seven days. Seven, seven days Seven to days, get there. days, yes. Because it's okay. the, then that day there, when you're there the seventh day, you're starting to uh, extend the mountain at that point there, which uh, I can talk about that when we start the, uh, the trip and everything else going to the top. Well, I, I guess we're almost to that point now. Okay. We're at the point where you're at the base of the mountain, you're, you're going to make that final ascent, and you're mm. going to do this final ascent in one day, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And how f you're going from 14,000 to? To 19,000. To 19,000 feet. So you've got a pretty good climb to do in one day. Yes, it is. That's and how about the, the uh, effect of the, the atmosphere at that point? I mean, there's not much air up there at that point. No, Multitude. there isn't, but one thing we did do, one of the things we had to take was malaria tablets because it was one of those third world countries. And also there was a pill we took that acetazolamide, which was supposedly for altitude sickness. And uh, so we took that and it was a 250 milligram tablet, which I cut in half. It took half in the morning, half at night. So that's supposed to help you out. And then, um, so the last day when we started to ascend the mountain there, so we got into camp something around noontime. We had lunch, we had about, uh, about 1 o'clock, and uh, I don't know, we had lunch, and then we had uh, dinner about 4.30, so they want us to go to bed at 5 o'clock, so we get about four or five hours sleep before we start to climb the mountain. Okay, so you're, 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 you're sleeping, and the next day you're going to climb the mountain. Now, you're climbing the mountain. Somebody told me that you were cl climbing the mountain at night, is that yes, correct? Yes, exactly. When I said that we had to go to bed at 5 o'clock, so we had to be up at... 10.15 that night, so at 10.15 we got up, we had just a, some tea and coffee and maybe a couple pieces of toast and such, and so by 11.15 we're starting at, uh, at night, started to ascend the mountain, so it's all nightfall that we're climbing the mountain to the top to the first point, which is about seven hours to the top, which they call Stella Points, just under 18,000 feet, and the sun is just coming over the ridge, it's such a beautiful sight, it's just amazing, that's what they do, they want you to see the uh, sun come up just over the mountain as you reach the first point. Okay. And it's actually just gorgeous at that point there. And then we have another, about an hour and 20 minutes before we reach the top of the uh, Kilimanjaro. So I hope you got some good pictures along the way. Got some. Unfortunately, when I got to the top, I was able to take six more pictures and uh, the camera gave out, the battery gave out. I had a new one, but it was so darn cold up there. And that's my comment about that is as we're hiking, that night, I mean, it's bitterly cold. I mean, it's so cold you had to have, I had two layers of thermal underwear, plus three more layers of clothes, plus a parka, plus uh, one pair of gloves, which was not sufficient. You had to have another pair, otherwise your fingers would be 
probably frozen off. I had hand warmers in my gloves. I had uh, warmers in my boots. And the feet were fine, but the hands were really cold. And it's about 20 degrees with the winds and such. It's bitterly cold as you walk up. It's really cold. Boy, this sounds like a lot of fun to me, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't ex I didn't know it was going to be that uh, brutal, to tell you the truth. And uh, once you got top of the mountain, you only spent about 20 minutes up there, take a few pictures, and you want to get back down because it's cold up there. How's the view from up there? Oh, just gorgeous. I mean, you can see 360, and you can see so far. It's just truly an amazing sight. It's just beautiful, and especially when you see the glaciers on all sides and the uh, glacier fields and the people coming up, and they're just tired and ragged. I mean, people are just saying, is it over? <laughs> but then you still got the three and a half hours to get down, and fortunately... And you do that the same day. You do it the same day, yes. And you take a different trip down. It's, uh, the backside is a little bit different. It's almost like going down, and it only takes three and a half hours because it's almost like the sand dunes in, uh, up in uh, Traverse City there where you, when you take a step, you slide down, you slide down, and it takes much quicker. But it's very hard on the knees and legs and such, and more people get injured then than they do going up. Wow. So you started out with 12 people? 14. 14 people. 14, yes. And did you have anybody drop out of this trip? Yeah, two of the people, no, nobody dropped out, but two did not even try to go up the mountain. And uh, so 12 of the 14 made it, and then we had one other lady that made it to the very top, and she was so spent that they had to actually take her down in a gurney. And it took, uh, you know, something like 18 hours before they got back to the base camp and to the final camp where they were able to take her out of the whole um, area, take her to the hotel because she was wiped out. How in the world did they get her down the mountain? Oh, it's, it's interesting. They I hope she wasn't like a, a real, real big lady. She was uh, probably about 160 pounds, I would say. Okay. They had they had a front end of a motorcycle, and they had a gurney on top of it, which was attached to it. So they laid her and strapped her in there, and there was six porters that bring her down. They actually three on each side, and they get her down the mountain. So they're, they've got a, a motorcycle wheel and yeah. they got her on top of that? Well, yeah, it's like a shocks in there, and then a gurney that lays on top of oh. it there. Yeah, so it was amazing how they did that, and then all the way to camp. and. Uh, so it was. So uh, did they had they did they actually bring her out to 40 miles? No, just the last well down the mountain and then another five miles to the next Millennium Camp and then 10 more miles out of the camp. So it was about 18 miles to take her out. Okay. Yeah, it was because uh, our last well after after we finished the trip on the mountain, then we have to go back. And when we get to the base camp, then we have lunch. We rest a couple uh, hours and then we have to travel another three hours to our last camp, a Millennium Camp. So we actually spent. 14 and a half hours uh, hiking that day. Wow. And we only had like five hours sleep from the day before, and that's all we had. So it was a long <laughs> and brutal day, to tell you the truth. So you guys were having a great time, I bet. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, oh, yeah, we all took the pain. It was no problem. And uh, you could see the ones that could really go faster, because when we went to the last camp, we had about eight people that were way ahead of us, and there was like five of us. We were just kind of trudging real slow behind the, um, the, the front of the pack there so it didn't matter because we knew where we we're going so it didn't really make a difference till so, we got the last so camp. the final hike out wasn't anywhere near as long as the hike in um well it was the last day was 10 miles out okay yeah, it was about six hours to get out before the, we met the buses there at what they call the moranga camp and that's the last spot out before they get on the bus and we go back to our hotel back in moshi okay and that was uh, fine because now after eight days with no showers and all that stuff, it was nice to get back to the hotel, <laughs> get some decent food, and we were able to shower and then dust all your clothes off. We washed them off and everything else. I was able to get one of the cleaning ladies and get a bucket of water and start to take all the dust off and rinse off your clothes and such to get the dust off. Right. Yeah, it was amazing how dusty you get. All right. Well, we're going to take a, just a short break right here. We'll be back in a couple minutes, and uh, we have a lot more to talk about. Jim actually went to the Serengeti uh, after this trip, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So uh, we'll be right back. Prescription drug abuse is a national epidemic. The new in way to obtain drugs is through parents or grandparents' medicine chests. Removing prescriptions from your cabinet is the best way to keep drugs out of the hands of our young people. We've got to work together to protect our teens, our seniors, and our environment. Clean out your medicine cabinet today. Please participate in Operation Medicine Cabinet and drop off your unwanted or expired prescriptions at one of our law enforcement drop-off sites in Oakland County. We can't ignore this situation anymore. Oh, 
welcome back. We're here with Jim Robeck, and we're talking about his wonderful trip to Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, Jim, why, after, you know, we, we went through the first part of the trip on the first part of the program. Can you tell us why in the world you decided to take this trip? Well, it was interesting how we got to that point. Uh, I met a young lady about four years ago when I was in Peru. Her name was Samantha, A.K. Sam, and uh, she said, we want to go to China, and I said, and she asked me if I'd be interested, and after reluctance, said, okay, finally, I said, we'll go, and from that point on, we have visited now 10 countries, and this uh, Africa will be our sixth continent, so she's kind of a person who likes to uh, explore and such, and I'm kind of that same person, so I said, why not, you know, and I said, you know, this is on the bucket list, we'll say, so from that point on, uh, like, so we've done all these traveling, and we said, oh, this would be the highlight of one of our trips, so this was the reason we decided to uh, go to Kilimanjaro and hike it. Wow. Well, you're probably one of the most traveled guys that I know. <laughs> You've been to how many continents now? Well, this is the sixth one. Sixth I'm not sure we'll get to Antarctica. That's the seventh one, so I'm not sure we'll get there, but it might one of these days. <laughs> That's great. Anyway, uh, you, you got, I assume you got some kind of uh, certificate award when you uh, got back from your trip on the mountain. Yes, we got two certificates. One was actually from the park itself uh, to Kilimanjaro from the rangers and the uh, country of Tanzania and also from the um, uh, tour group, which is called Zara. They probably have 80% of the tours that go to Africa to climb Kilimanjaro, okay. and they're pretty big, and they pay off the government pretty well, <laughs> to <laughs> say the least, because they have so many land roads. Surprisingly, that Toyota probably has 95% of the land rovers that over they call them land cruisers, so I was surprised that Land Rover, which is the English model car, right. would be there, but it isn't. It's all Toyotas. Is it? Oh, gosh, yes. Hmm. Now, you went back to the, you're down back to the hotel, mm -hmm. and now you've got the second half of your trip, which is really uh, going into the, the park where all the animals are. Is that correct? Correct. That's right. It's the Serengeti, which is a safaris. This is the second part of the trip. It's safaris, and we visit uh, three parks there, basically Serengeti, the Gorongoro Crater, and also the Tangarai uh, National Park. So those are the three more that we tagged. And actually, there's one more. The, uh, they call it the... Um, Oh, geez, I can't remember it. It's Maryland, I think it is. Okay. But there was four of them. Okay. So uh, tell us about the first one. Well, the first one we went to was kind of a small one. A portion we got there, uh, apparently there was a big storm and washed away all the museum and everything else. It was totally crumbled down. But they took us in anyways, and we saw some baboons and some minimum amount of animals there, like giraffe, um, a lot of baboons, monkeys, some gazelles, and things of that nature. But... Uh, didn't see no hippopotamus there. And one of the interesting part there are the baboons there. They eat what they call this uh, kind of a fruit from the sausage tree, and they're just nibbling on that son of a gun on the side of the road. There's like 30 uh, baboons there, and they're chewing on these, uh, these called sausages from the sausage tree. And I said, that's what they call it, a sausage <laughs> tree. So that's amazing. Yeah, and they're all over the yeah. place, you know. I mean, very close. We're in, in a Jeep, basically, with the top, which is open, where we can take pictures. Right. And so we never are allowed to get out of the vehicles nowhere on the Serengeti, okay. any place on all these safaris. Hmm. So first day you spent pretty much uh, just in this small park. Right. And then where do you go from okay, there? Okay, next we went to, then we went to the Serengeti basically. Um, now well, th this is the big one, right? This is the big one, right. And from that point on, that's where you actually see the animals and you go through this gate. And one of the things we do see once you get into the Serengeti is that we go to this Old Dubai Gorge is where, um, Lewis and Mary Lakey basically found human remains that go back almost like three, three million years ago. Really? And this is a site they've excavated, and it's one of the real heritage sites that they continue to excavate, and they found various weapons that they used, and they even found a footprint in the volcanic dust that was there to prove that there was something like a human being there. From three million years three ago? Three million years ago. It's amazing. In wow. fact, they, there's a, uh, what they call the Lucy Legacy, which is from Ethiopia. They found the remains of a female, which they have 40% of the skeletal parts of a female, and it shows that they had a small head, which was the size of an ape, but they were able to walk upright, which is a biped, and uh, so they feel that, that was the earliest signs of uh, civilization, basically. Wow. It's amazing what they found, how they can find in the middle of the Serengeti uh, planes there, it's amazing. And they even have, they even uh, had made their own tools. Their own yes, they did. They so had on. their we own weapons at that time, yes. Wow. It was amazing that they're uh, digging these up and actually show them there. And they had a little museum there also, which was real nice. And they had a ranger that described what was going on, what happened and such. And overlooks a huge area there with kind of a red uh, 
clay there, and uh, very nice, very nice to see it. Well, tell us about the various animals that you saw there. I mean, what was the most plentiful? I mean, did uh, you see a lot of, uh, what do you call them, antelopes? Or not they're, they're not antelopes, they're Yeah, they're antelopes something. and gazelles. Okay, yeah. gazelles is what uh, I was thinking of. Yeah. Just to go back a second, uh, the Serengeti in, in Swahili, they originally were called Stringeti, and then they basically t exchanged it, or not changed, but they changed it to Serengeti, which means endless plains, which means that as far as you can see, it's endless. I mean, it's amazing, just like grassland, you know, it's, I think like being in the Midwest of the United States, as far as you would see wheat fields, it's almost the same thing. It's right. unbelievable, just as far as the eye can see, just gorgeous. Uh, minimal amount of trees, uh, but um, the animals, Almost every animal you can think of from antelope to zebras were there, you know, and, and gazelles are probably the largest contingency, both the uh, Thompson gazelle and the Grant gazelle. The okay. Thompsons are all over the place. They're probably about two to three feet high maximum, and there's thousands of these. Zebras, there's a lot of those. Every animal you can think of, there's packs of them. I mean, even giraffes, we saw 20 and 30 at a time of giraffes. You know, I would only think of a zoo where you only see one. Here you see 20 or 30 of them. And wow. It was amazing. Elephants, you know, in bands of from two to 10 to 12, you know, basically. Lions were kind of, uh, you know, simple. There was maybe two or three females. Uh, a male, basically, we saw four males in one area that when they are born, the males, they are kicked out of the group and they really? have to get stronger. When they get stronger after three or four years, then they'll challenge the dominant male. Okay. And if they can take the dominant male, then they take over the, the, uh, the lioness, as we'll say, basically. So it's interesting that they're in the field all by themselves, you know, and until they, get strength and get older, they will not participate in the family part of it, like a lot, like the elephants. So they got to go and uh, prove themselves. Prove themselves, absolutely. That's what they have to do. And then... Um, did, you s did you see them, like, chasing any uh, food or getting any meat? Yes, I did. I mean, there was a lioness who had a kill, and she was eating, and then all of a sudden this male lion starts to creep up toward her, and all of a sudden they start to fight for about 15 or 20 seconds, and they were doing all that good stuff like cats normally uh, fight. And she has to basically man you off, and he starts to take the kill and starts eating it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> the dominant male, he he just lets her do the hunting, and then he just uh, horns in and takes the the meal away from her. That's it's pretty amazing. Good, yeah, <laughs> and we saw a similar thing. I didn't see, but another group of people saw elephants where the baby, the, the our car separated the mother from the baby, and the mother elephant screeched and hollered, and she really made a big ruckus, and they stopped, and then. Four or five ele elephants came around, surrounded the baby and the mother. So they're actually protecting protected the baby. Protected the baby. Yeah, it was amazing. They said it was really loud and screechy, and they said it was one of the most unusual sights they saw in their life. It was amazing that they protect the family. It's really amazing the elephants. Huh? They're smart. They are. <laughs> and we saw cheetahs up in the trees. You know, they were up there. You know, just laying in the branches of the acacia tree. There was two of them, and they're just watching us, and we're watching them, you know, and they got their feet dangling there. And I said, what are these stupid tours doing, you know? Yeah. So, but then just beyond that, we went down another 100 feet. We saw, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, there were leopards in the, tr in the trees, but the cheetah was about uh, 200 yards away. She was in the grasslands. Okay. So we saw those also, and wow. uh, the big cats. We saw so the you saw all the, all the, you know, the traditional animals that you think about seeing. Yeah, well, zebras, what? wildebeest, hartebeest, warthogs, jackals, hyenas, everything that you've seen from the road there, basically. And some are very close within 30 feet, some are maybe a couple hundred yards away. Birds of all types, you got the, uh, the vultures, the eagles, uh, the storks, every kind of uh, bird you can think of is there. Now, when you, when you drove through in, your, in this uh, vehicle that you're in, did, did any of the animals you know, challenge you or get excited no, about you getting through there? None whatsoever. They're just they so lax. much used to it. They're used to it. They're so lax that they just walk. You know, they're just. I mean, we saw lions that were with their feet straight up in the air. And they're sleeping. They're not doing anything. <laughs> they don't care. You know, say the sun's nice. You know, I'm just going to bask here in the sun, basically. So. So they lead a pretty good life. Oh, that they do. The female know. goes out and kills the kills the prey. Then the male comes in and takes, takes over, over and, 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 and eats it, right? Yeah, exactly. Say, what's this? You know, it's a pretty good system. Do. I kind of like I that. I guess it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it sure is. So you. Uh, Basically, you were you were in this uh, environment uh, for how many days? Oh, five days with all the various national parks there. Oh, really? Yeah. So you had another. Yeah, we went to like the Gorongoro, which is a uh, they call it Gorongoro uh, crater, and this where the there was a volcano happened like about a million years ago, and it just collapsed, and then they have probably about 25% of the animals live in there. Unfortunately, no new animals come in there, which they can maybe inbreed, and this is where we found the black rhino. This is the only place that you find the black rhino, which is almost extinct now. There was about, they say there's about 30 some 
for these black rhinos in this area, but we saw one, but it's way so far in the distance. I'm hoping that somebody got a good picture because my camera wasn't able to bring them in. Really? And they say there's only about 2,000 left in the world because they're becoming extinct because the Chinese and other countries like the uh, horn for the aphrodisiac. They figure if they have some of this, they can live longer. So uh, it was interesting. We uh, heard a story about one of the government officials had one of those horns in his car, and they sell for between three to forty thousand dollars. Wow! So you know, if there might be some poaching still going, but the rangers are starting to really makes uh, a dent in the poachers now. So there's no hunting that takes place on the Serengeti at no, all. No, none whatsoever. In the Gorongoro, the Serengeti, any national park is not allowed, even if. Uh, the drivers, if they were to kill a, uh, an animal, would be very serious offense. Really? Uh, so yes, it would be so. There's no roadkill or anything they can do, and uh, there's no meat that you would eat us from the uh, from the Serengeti, any place. Okay. Wow. And we had nice places to sleep, especially in the Serengeti, which was similar. We had two-man uh, tents, but these were like house tents that we had both in the Serengeti, both places in the Gorongoro and the um, um, Serengeti. I mean, there were nice tents. Uh, Real large. They used to have hot showers in one of them, but the other one, we one on the Serengeti, we had cold showers, which at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the temperature drops from about 70 to about 35, and you take a cold shower. I'm telling you, you're talking about <laughs> hearing a lot of noises and That's screeches. That's a waker upper, huh? <laughs> it was a big waker up before you go to, uh, go to dinner. It, just, it was amazing, but you had to do it because, again, the roads are dusty, they're very rocky and such, and uh, so right. you need to take a shower. Well, Jim, we got to wrap it up okay. about this time, and uh, we certainly want to thank you for coming in and talking to us about your wonderful trip. It's a, I guess it's proof that seniors are active. Yes, they are. I they're was active right here in the Orient Center. Absolutely. I was the <laughs> oldest in the group. I was 73. The next youngest was 71 to a low of 16. We had a young sophomore from high school from Chicago who came with his dad, so it was really nice. Okay. And a good broad spectrum of people. Great. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We, uh, we're back with uh, Jim Robeck. And we're going to talk a little bit more about his uh, hike up Kilimanjaro. And uh, we really have some artifacts with us today, as well as some of the gear that he used on the trip. So, Jim, let's talk about some of the uh, equipment you used to make this wonderful hike. Okay. On front of our table here, we have what they call the uh, compression bag, which holds my sleeping bag. This is compresses quite uh, nicely there, as you can see here, because we only have so much room in the black bag that's at the end there. We have to put all our equipment in there, for example. So. That's the compression bag with our sleeping bag. Uh, the purple one is the mattress, which is an air mattress you have to blow up, which you basically, they do have a pad there, but you want an air mattress because, again, this is all rock, hard, hard ground, so as much as you can protect your body, it's nice. Uh, and then you have the black bag, which is a liner. If you get real cold, I have a liner there, which I utilize because if it gets pretty cold at night there. And on top of that is the hiking poles that we use. They extend out to the, you know, the proper length that you need. And after the hiking poles, you have what they call gaiters. This is used like chaps on your, from your knee to your hiking boot there, which is the blue stuff there. And uh, basically that uh, takes away any sharp rocks that may cut your leg or something like that. And just behind that, I don't know if it's possible to see, there's a, a little light there that we used for hiking up Kilimanjaro. It's a headlamp. I don't know if I can reach over here and just bring it up for you, if you can see it here. I'll try to reach for it, it's right here. This is on your head when you're going up to the uh, mountain there. And all that stuff now will fit in the black bag there, which is the porter's carry, up to a maximum of 30 pounds that they will carry. That's the max you can have. So you put all that stuff in there, plus all your clothes that are in there that you have, your shaving, your emergency uh, kit there for any uh, injuries you might have, like Band-Aids and such, your medica medicines and everything else goes in the black bag, and they carry that up from camp to camp to camp. So they're okay. carrying that. Now, and how uh, how cold will you, will that uh, bag go down? That'll to? go down to uh, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, it's, it's and then when warm. you add the black one on top of that, oh, I can go down below zero then. Can you? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's it, I can be very comfortable. It's a it's, it's a mummy sleeping bag, which is a very very comfortable, uh, very comfortable and very warm. It's in fact in the middle of the night sometimes three o'clock in the morning I'd be shedding clothes. I was so hot. Really? <laughs> I would sweat basically. And uh, so everything goes in that black bag, and that's, you pack that every morning, so the porters come and get that, and they put it in their bag, and they start carrying it to the next camp. The last one is my uh, hiking um, a backpack, which you can carry up to 15 pounds. This is where you have your water, your rain gear, anything you want, like snacks and such, are in the backpack there up to a maximum of 15 pounds. And the less you can do, the better, because carrying that weight as you're hiking can be very <laughs> strenuous. So. In fact, uh, we had the guy there, she went through my bag there to take out stuff that I really shouldn't have in there, so I got down about 12 pounds because okay. it's very important to be as light as possible because it is a, is a task to walk up and hike up the mountain. 
Well, let's talk about some of these items you have on the table here, Jim. Sure. Um, got, uh, well, these are like wooden um, um, artifacts they had. This is a, basically, this is a giraffe here. This is a zebra here. I bought it for my grandson. We're gonna put it on the wall here. These were kind of interesting. I think these were like about $15 each. So it wasn't a bad price for uh, these particular items here. Uh, here's a mask that uh, he wanted. So I bought a mask that looks something like this here. And I think this was like $20. So, you know, could be a little expensive, but for the price and for the artifacts they have. We bought this from the uh, Maasai tribe there in uh, the Serengeti. Uh, the women make these things. They have like a little uh, store there. And we paid $10 for this. You know, it might be overpriced, but they spent about six to eight hours of making this thing, so for the value right. and such. So it was nice to buy something from the local um, uh, tribesmen there. And then all these little uh, necklaces here, we've got quite a few of them. <laughs> they bargained real well. This guy was trying to sell them. We were on the bus there, and he kept saying three for five dollars. said, no, 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 and he went to five, six, seven. He says, eight for ten dollars. okay, for ten dollars, what the heck. So I bought ten of these things. I don't know what I'm going <laughs> to do with them. But the, so they got elephants and giraffes and little skulls on there. So it was kind of nice to support the economy. and provide some funds for them and uh, right. so it was nice. Well, can you show us a st certificate you got? Well, this is uh, two certificates we received. This is actually from the uh, country of Tanzania signed by the uh, ranger and also one of the government officials in Tanzania and it shows the time that you arrive at Kilimanjaro at the very top. It's a nice little um, certificate they provide for you and also you also received one from the Czar group which is the one that actually uh, set the uh, tour up and they basically did it and um, so they provide a certificate too but I cherish more the first one there because that's actually from the country of Tanzania it was that's fantastic great. yeah so and uh, so they were real nice they gave this at the end there which I thought was very nice on their part so uh, shows you the momentous uh, memento that you got from uh, hiking up the Kilimanjaro so you get something that proves that you did it right because right. every time every uh, hiker that came up, they actually record the time when you got to the top. Uh -huh. So it's kind of neat. So it's straight on the certificate. Okay. Well, Jim, I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It's been a very, very interesting conversation with Jim Robeck. Jim uh, has, uh, again, traveled more around the world than I think anybody in our group <laughs> and has uh, now done six continents and is now going to continue to move on. Hopefully someday maybe you'll make Ant Antarctica as uh, your Possibly. last stop. Hopefully, maybe one of these days. Okay, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.